Today I have Gretchen Rubin stopping by. Oh, I'm so happy to be talking to you. Thank you, thank you. This is exactly where you need to come for credible life advice. You ask the questions and we're gonna answer them. For those of you who don't know, because you've clearly been living under a rock for the last, how, <laughs> how long ago was it that you, pu that you published The Happiness Project? The 10th anniversary edition is coming out in November. Oh, so, that's, yeah. congratulations. Yeah. That's great. Um, Gretchen Rubin is one of today's most influential and thought-provoking observers of happiness and human nature. She's known for her dis ability to distill and convey complex ideas with human and clarity in a way that's accessible to a wide audience. So what I was shocked when I first read your book ages ago was that The Happiness Project was you're so smart. Oh, gosh, that's nice to hear. It's true. And I'm not just saying that because you obviously have amazing credentials. You went to Yale. You went to Yale Law School. You clerked for Sandra Day O'Connor, as we talked about. It was, it was sort of how I felt about, I, I sort of felt about this way about Elizabeth Gilbert. Mm. I read Eat, Pray, Love, and I was like, okay. And then I read her book on marriage. Mm -hmm. Have you ever read her book on marriage? Yeah, is it Cleaving? Is it? No, uh, it's, um, I can't remember the exact title of it. Mm -hmm. She wrote no, it. I did read she it. wrote it. It was brilliant. Yeah. And it's very well researched. Not that I didn't love Eat, Pray, Love. So when you pick up the Happiness Project, what's unexpected to me about it was that you think like, okay, like sort of like, you know, adorable, this is gonna be sweet. You have jam packed it, not only with practical information, but your ability to draw from so many famous oh. writers. Oh, well that's so nice to hear. Was Thank amazing you. to me. And I have a, qu actually a, somebody wrote in a question because okay. I know I'm interviewing. Excellent. So that was the game I wanted to play with Okay, sure, great. Yeah, you want to yeah, play yeah, a little yeah. game? Yeah. Okay, let me, um, uh, sorry, this is, which is fine. I'm just going to stop here for a second. We will cancel, we're good. Okay. Um, okay, so. Uh, the game. Okay. Here we go. So I had some, I asked people if they wanted to come in and they wanted to do a, uh, you were coming in and they wanted to ask some questions. Okay. And so I, again, I was talking to you about Barbara Walters. Okay. Yes. Right. Right. So Barbara Walters, uh, would take index cards and she would put them all around a table and then she would reorganize them. And mm. so when I was looking at these, I was like, oh God. I don't know the, I could talk to you for hours. Uh -huh. I don't know, I don't know the order yes. with which I should ask these questions. So I thought like, well, maybe it would be really fun if you actually picked the card. Oh, just like yeah, pick a and card, any card? And yeah, pick a card, any card. Okay, right? excellent. And, okay, so I thought this was pretty apt because in the Happiness Project, you talk about wanting to be more playful. Yes. And play games. Yes. Yeah. And that doesn't necessarily come naturally to me. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Does it come naturally to you? No. 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 Right. The only game I like to play is Uno. Right. That's the only game that I like to play. Right. Is yeah. Uno? That's so old fashioned. No, it's like a little kid's game. That's like saying that you like to play Go Fish or something. I know. Yeah, it is. Like, I like. Or I'm not. Game. I'm not a game player. Yeah. But I love whimsy, so this is good. This okay. Is good. Okay. And I like. I like randomness. Too. I know randomness. Well, some of them are a little heavier than others. Okay. Just warning you. All right. Okay. So go ahead. You want to pick? Okay. My handwriting is terrible. Okay. So I'm gonna let you read it. it okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh oh. Love these. These are writer. These are questions for a writer. Okay. Okay. Do you miss writing biographies? I do miss writing biographies. I wrote a biography of Winston Churchill and one of JFK, and oh, it was just such a joy to write both those books. And there are many people who I would love to write a biography about. So maybe who, one who, day. Would you have anyone you would want to? Tell I would us? love to write about Benjamin Franklin because I just love Benjamin Franklin. What about Samuel Johnson? You just did a I podcast love Samuel on Johnson. Him. I love Samuel Johnson. Him. Um, I love Benjamin Franklin. You would do. I would do. Yeah. Um, Saint Therese of Lisieux is my spiritual yes. master, even though I'm not even Catholic. I would love to write a biography of oh. Saint Therese of like. There's probably not anything out there. there really. No, there there is, but I feel like they all kind of miss it. Like I feel like they haven't quite got it right. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I would like to do one. Um, and then I would love to do one of Leonardo da Vinci because um, I like people who are kind of multifaceted or unexpected and so um, yeah so I would love to do another biography. So you're a huge lover of libraries mm -hmm. and the New York Public Library in particular. Mm -hmm. Did you write those two biographies sitting in the New York Public Library? Not the New York Public Library there's another library that's just a block from my house called the New York Society Library yes. which is like it's older than the United States it was like occupied by the British during the revolution. So it's like a big town. Yeah, yeah yeah George Washington had like uh. overdue fees. Um, 
Um, and uh, it's right by my yeah, house. Are you kidding or is that no, true? no, no, that's true. Uh, or I don't know if he played, had fees, but he was de he definitely had an overdue book. And um, the uh, and they have a floor there, which is like the writing floor, and you have to be totally quiet. And like they like if you're typing too loudly on your keyboard, people will admonish you to be more quiet. Right. So it's a very and I like working like in that kind of environment in a library or even in a place like a coffee shop. And so when I'm doing deep writing, I'll often go there and to work the, there to that library. Yeah, it's a wonderful little library. So do you think you'll turn back to biography at some point? Maybe. There's so many books I would like to write. I hope that I can go back to biography at some point. Yeah. Okay, good, because we could use your your touch uh, out yeah. there. Yeah. Plus, because, again, when you read your books, you're really a historian. Yeah. So what did you major in in college? English. English. Did you minor in history? I didn't, no. I mean, I might have almost minored, in, I, but I didn't. Yeah, because officially. you have a huge, you're, well, yeah. you're an avid reader. Yeah. You're an avid intellectual. You're an academic, really, yeah. in yeah. a lot of ways. So. In a lot of ways, yeah. Yeah, in a lot of ways. Okay. Um, will you ever try your hand at children's literature? Oh, you know, this is interesting because I'm a raving fan of children's yes, literature. That's why when you uh, made the uh, Harry comment, yeah, the Harry Potter comment, I was like, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need you to see what this is like. Oh, oh. Eric, we can hear that. Yeah, sorry. My, my audio guy's checking oh. sound. Go ahead. Um, and, and in fact, on my site, I have a list of my 81 favorite works of children's literature and young adult literature because I just like made a list of my, my top, top, top favorites. Um, I don't have like a fiction bone. I've written three novels that were terrible that I've locked in a desk drawer. Oh. But I wonder if someday I will just wake up with like a story in my head or like a retelling of a story that I love. Like, could I t t tell the modern version? Um, so I would, I, I would, I think about sometimes whether that would be a fun thing to do. But I see my sister how writing fiction is very different from writing nonfiction. Right. I'm not sure, I have that 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 ability, but it would be fun to try. And so you never feel like when you read uh, when you read Harry Potter, obviously she just channeled something greater. Oh my gosh! Well, do J.K. Rowling is yeah. like a genius beyond compare. Yeah. But do you ever feel like you're just channeling stuff? Does it come to you like that creatively, or no? It does sort of sometimes. I have had like weird moments where I'm like, all of a sudden, everything will just sort of like. Um, I'll just have a clarity. Like when I realized that you could describe Churchill's life as a classical tragedy, I was like, yes. I remember like sitting there and thinking it through and being like, but what about this? But what about this? But like a half an hour. Or like when I realized, when I did my Four Tendencies book, um, I, I saw these patterns in human nature, but I couldn't figure out like if they were connected or how they were connected or like what the, what the thread was. I had this kind of sense that everything was like somehow intertwined, but I couldn't, I couldn't put my finger on it. It was driving me crazy for months. And I was just thinking and thinking and thinking oh. about it. And then there was a day where I was just sitting there and it was like the word expectation, just like, which <gasps> sounds very boring, but to me it was like, Huge. literally like, I was like shaking and sweating and I was like, this is it, this is it. So sometimes I have those moments. They are few and far between, but they're super exciting when they happen. Or the happiness project, when I had the, when I had the thought, I should do a happiness project. It was, it was like, like, boom, boom. I was yeah. like, Whoa! Yeah. yeah, like I literally stopped in my tracks. Kind yeah. of like when you met your husband. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Maybe I'm very subject to epiphany. That's <laughs> one of the things I like about myself. I love how yeah. you said that. I'm yeah. very subject to epiphany. Yeah, it's a great. It's a very fun. It's very fun. <laughs> That's a good one. So uh, I'm going to ask you a couple more questions about being yeah. a writer, but then I want to turn back to something you just said about this because oh, okay. um, we have to get to it. It's oh, really interesting, good. and I think you touched upon something that many people need to hear. Um, and they don't realize they need to hear it, but mm. I'm going to tell them that they need to hear okay. it. Okay. Okay. Um, how do you keep track of all your quotes? Oh, I have a... All the I, research I, that so you do. I have, um, a do. I have a document called Quotations Pre-2006 and a document called Quotations 2006 Plus. So whenever <laughs> I have a new quotation, it goes in there. I also have a different um, quotation for things that are like one sentence long. So like the days are long, but the years are sh the, the the days are long, but the years are short. Like that would be in a separate document because that's just one sentence. And I said it, but I would still put it in there. Um, and so, um, so I just have this giant trove um, that I draw from constantly, and uh, it's one of the joys of my life. Like I love I, even since I was like six years old, I would love to write down passages from books. I have all these books that I did by hand when I was younger. Um, which I called blank books, which right. I would fill with quotations. And now I do it by computer because my handwriting is so bad. And also I need to be able to find things, you know, by search. 
But so it's so much fun for me. So I have this moment so of happiness. Carry, but do you carry around a computer and then like you see a quote or you're reading and you're like, I have to write that down? Well, I have a very elaborate note, note taking your... note taking process. So when uh, I read a book, I'll, I'll like mark it as I go that there's something I want to so, take notes on. And okay. then I'll go back at the end. The lawyer so, of you, yeah, the so lawyer in you is like very good at it, annotating. Well, it's good yeah. because it, then it helps me remember what I'm, especially if I'm writing a book where it's like there's a lot of material to, to remember. Yes. It helps me to kind of go back through and, and like, and type it, I think literally type yes. it. Um, but then one of the things that's so fun is I have this moment of ha happiness newsletter where I send out a newsletter, uh, like an email every day with a happiness quotation. So it's a really fun thing to always be sort of looking around in the world like, oh, what a wonderful Emerson quotation, or yeah. oh, somebody sent me an email and their signature is this wonderful Emily Dickinson poem or whatever. So, so great. Yeah. So you just keep track of them. Yeah. How do you have time to write that every day? Um, well, because I keep the quotations, it's not so that it's hard. So it's not that hard. Yeah, because do you do that every single day, or do you, mm -hmm. do you schedule it out? It's five days a week. Yeah, no, and I schedule it out. Yeah, you schedule yeah. it out. Yeah, yeah. So you'll sit down for a day and sort of write all the. Well, uh, actually, whenever I have new ones, now I'm all caught up with what I have, but yeah. I just have so many new ones. I always know that I'm going to have some new ones. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, Gretchen. but it's funny. A lot of people really like to start their day with like oh, a really good yeah. quotation. It's like, kind of, it's sort of a transcendent thing to kind of get you going or of like course. sort of put you in the right frame of mind for your day. Just like people who read a Bible verse every day or like a, Oh you yeah. Know, I um, love, I have note. this mom agenda and there's yeah. a quote at the top of that yeah. and I, I look think at it every day. People really like that. Yeah. yeah. I certainly do. There's yeah. another guy who does the tut tut notes from the universe. Jeff, oh, uh, I Mike Dooley. Mike yes. Dooley. Yeah. That's gotten very popular yeah. as well. Yeah. I think it's brilliant. Yeah. I think it's just fun. Yeah. Yeah. Or Especially, like even word of the day, mm -hmm. you know? Word of the day. Yeah, yeah, or my, my mother-in-law gets poem of the day. So she reads a poem so every day ridiculous. from like the oh, National that's Poetry beautiful. Foundation. So we need to do more of that. We'd yeah. be a better place if yeah. more people read poetry and yeah. started she their morning with that. the best ones. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, do you make, okay, this is sort of a writer's question. Do you make and stick to your resolutions in terms of your writing? Yes, I do. You yeah. do? Yeah. So do you write every single day? Is I that do. a resolution? And do you have yes. a period of time where like you shut off the phone, nobody can call you, I'm doing this for two hours? You know, I wish that I could because yes. I'm a creature of habit and I would love to have that kind of regularity. Like to be a Benedictine monk is like yes. my ideal life. I know. Um, I would love to live that way, but I can't and I don't I um, because my Me day too. is different every day. Um, and so I really have to just, every day I think, okay, like if I'm actually writing a book, I will say when do I, I want to write for three hours. Like doing serious original writing three hours is about as much as i can do in a day yes. so i'll look for like but I, it's not always in the same part of the day because mm -hmm. it has to move yes. and then if i'm not doing uh, like actually writing a book where i'm in a different phase like right now i have a book coming out in march so the book is done but there's a lot of work to be done around the book um outer order inner calm um that i fit in as i as i can you know because mm -hmm. uh I know. I wish I had that kind of regularity. I know. It's too hard. It's I too hard. Well, and your mom as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So you've got a lot. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, before we get to the new book, I want to start with this one. Yes. Okay. So the four tendencies. Yes. So there's this, um, after doing what I did for so long, there, have you read the five love languages? Yes, I have. Okay. So I read that, I don't know, like my first two years in private practice. They didn't give it to us in graduate school. No, no, no. It's very like... It's very like fluffy, yeah, right? Very, so it's yeah. for those of you who don't know the five love languages, what it is, is it's a book that um, Chapman, yeah, I think Gary it's... Chapman. Yeah, Gary Chapman He wrote. was a Christian marriage min yes. counselor and minister. And he came up with this quiz where you figure out wh what's your love language. Yeah. And you kind of try to beg your husband to take it. Believe me, I've worked with enough couples yeah. who had to do that. And you sit in bed at night and you laugh and you sort of fill out this thing. What I felt was so important about it, which gets lost so often, and I, one of the questions I had for you is I hope one day you write a book on marriage. Mm. Because I really thought your chapter in the Happiness Project on Aww. marriage and love was very, very good. Oh, well, thank you. Because I think what it pointed out was, A, there's just differences between men and women and how they experience intimacy. And number two was you cannot motivate somebody by the way you're motivated. No. You yeah. have to figure out how somebody else is motivated yes. and motivate them. And mm -hmm. the way I always say that, so I came to all these conclusions sort of qualitatively, like from experience, yes. right? And then I read them in a book, I'm like, oh, they articulated yes. what I was seeing in my practice, yes. right? Yeah. I sort of wish I'd had this book, all these books before I had started my right, private right, practice, right. it would have made sort of coming up with these ideas easier to right. explain. Right. Because you give us a language for yes. this. Having a vocabulary so that you're like, you're a morning person and I'm a night person. You're a simplicity yes. lover and I'm an abundance lover. It's like, you're oh. an underbuyer, I'm an overbuyer. Yeah, it's like, oh, it it's not that yes. one person's right and one person's no. wrong. It's just like now we have a way to just talk about like, yes. oh, well, given that that's the situation, how do we, what do we do now? Right. Rather than being like, 
what you do makes no sense. I don't understand. Like, trying what to you, argue them yeah, out of the yeah. way that they're behaving. Yeah. I always say to patients, and they look at me when I start talking about this concept, and I say, you should really just take the five love languages just to see where you fall, and it's fun, yeah, right? It it's is lighten fun. up things yeah. between a couple. But what's really crucial, and what I, the metaphor I usually give to them is, if you're coaching little kids on a soccer team, one kid might really respond to sort of a strict soccer coach. The other one, my son's a disaster. If anyone yeah. yells at my son, yeah. he's off the field. Right. Yeah. Right. He's like, uh, no, this yeah. is abusive. He, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to stand for this. Yeah. You know, my mom's a social worker, yeah. um, and he won't play. Yeah. Where if you're, if you play with him, if you get down on his level and you encourage him and give him a little bit of praise, he's great. Some kids need a lot of praise. Yeah. And that clicks for adults. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, why would I coach everybody the same way? Mm -hmm. But it's amazing in management and in marriages. We so often forget how to motivate other people yeah, yeah. because we just assume that they're motivated by the same things that motivate us. Yes, yeah. And so this is what the four tendencies yes. to me is really about. Yes. Now it's about how to understand how are you and how might you be alike or different from other people so that you can figure out how everybody can set things up in the way that works best for them yes. rather than thinking there's one right way or one best way because there's no magic one size fits all solution. So you, so you really created a Myers-Briggs in a way. Kind of, people yeah. said that to you, is that it bothers yeah. you when people say that? Or no, no, no. no, no. no because just, the the thing that's different about this is it's a very narrow aspect of personality. Yes. I think a lot of the, te like Myers Briggs yes. or DISC or a lot of them, try to paint a whole picture of a person. Yes. I'm talking about one very narrow aspect. It's a very, very significant aspect, but you can't really, you don't know anything else about a person. Because sometimes people will be like, well, all re rebels are creative, or all rebels are narcissists, or all obligers are people pleasers, or all pullers are type A, or all questioners are scientists or journalists. I'm like, no, you don't know that. Yes. All you know is how do they respond if you ask or tell them to do something, or if they ask or tell themselves to do something. That you will know, and that tells you a lot. But it doesn't paint a whole picture of a person. Right. Well, and the, the thing is that's key is that not only should you take this test, you have to give it to the people around you or apply the principles but to the people around you. A lot of times you can guess what the people around you are. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Although yeah. I, I always try to cheat on these tests, yeah. given the fact that I'm in the field, which yeah. is kind of funny, but I yeah. took the Myers-Briggs and I'm like, no, I'm such an introvert. Mm. Um, you've met me now for how yeah, long? Would yeah. you ever describe me as an introvert? No, no. But you could be an ambivert. <laughs> right. Well, I feel like I'm the most introverted extrovert I've mm -hmm. ever met. Right, right, right. I love that quiet solitude. Yeah, I would that's like exactly how I am. Well. Yeah. Susan King told me I was an ambivert, so I feel like that's official. That's official. That's, that's, Susan that's totally that's sounds it. official yeah. to me. Yeah. But um, so I, I think that like I always try to cheat on these tests. So I didn't actually know I would be a questioner. Mm. I thought I'd be a rebel, just because I wanted to be. So, Interesting. So can, probably for the audience, we should give okay. just a quick what, rundown okay. of what each one, and which one are you? Upholder. And up, oh, yes. Okay. I can see that about yeah, you. Yeah. So yeah. there's <laughs> upholder, questioner, obliger, Not and rebel. Not that I'm psychoanalyzing. No, 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 no. Yeah, That's like, yeah, that's uh, like... Um, my superpower. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> so it has to do with how you meet uh, expectations, outer expectations like a work deadline and inner expectations like uh, a New Year's resolution. Because the work deadline comes from the outside, it's your boss or your team, and the New Year's resolution is coming from within, it's what you want to do yourself. So um, upholders readily meet outer and inner expectations. So they meet the work deadline, they keep the New Year's resolution without much fuss. Uh, they want to know what other people expect from them, but their expectations for themselves are just as important. Then questioners. Right, right. So questioners question all expectations. They'll do it if they think it makes sense. So they resist anything arbitrary, inefficient, unjustified. Yeah. So they're making everything an inner expectation. If this meets their inner standard, makes sense, they'll do it. If it fails their standard, Forget they will it. push back. Yeah. yeah. Then there are obligers. Obligers readily meet outer expectations, but they struggle to meet inner expectations. Oh, so like a friend yeah. of mine who said- no, Those are less well, painful to be an obliger. Well, it's the biggest group for both men and women. You either they are an obliger in, or you have yes. many obligers in your life. But yes. so they are- I, the, you, I used to be an obliger, I think. Mm. I evolved out of that more. But keep mm. going, keep going. So an obliger, so like a friend of mine said, when I was in high school, I was on the track team and I never missed track practice, so I don't understand why I can't go running now. It's like, well, when you had a team and a coach waiting for you to show up, yes. you had no trouble, but when you're just trying to go on your own, it's a challenge. And then finally, rebels. Yes. Rebels um, resist all expectations, outer and inner alike. They want to do what they want to do in their own way, in their own time, mm -hmm. and they can do anything they want to do, anything they choose to do. But if you ask a or tell them to do something they're very likely to resist. And typically they don't Just even like to tell themselves what to do. Like they wouldn't take a 10 a.m. spin class on Saturdays because they don't like the idea that somebody expects them to do something at 10 a.m. on Saturday. What do they, how do they know what they're gonna to wanna to do on Saturday? Right, so quick question. When you do this, this test and yeah. you read this book, 
there's an element of how do we strengthen the parts that we're weakest yes, in, absolutely. right? Because that's right. a really important component yes. to this. Yes. So you sort of figure out what you are, and then you say, like, for example, if you're an obliger, you might want to try to round yourself out by right. saying, okay, how is that really best suiting my life? Is this really working for me being this way? Right. Well, what you would do is, is you would say, okay, so what do I, I'm, I'm good at meeting outer expectations. But I'm not good at meeting inner expectations because that's the definition of an obliger. So what do I do to meet inner expectations? Because obligers get frustrated. And, and what you do is you listen to her happiness, happier podcast. Yeah, 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 you watch your Facebook yeah, yeah, live yeah, yeah, page yeah, yeah, because yeah, 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 yeah. you have an enthusiasm to talk about this yeah. stuff that seems like it's endless. Oh, it is. Oh, my gosh. It is so endless. <laughs> but the thing is for obligers, it's to yeah. create outer accountability. If you want to read more, join a book right. page. If you want it to exercise. It seems pretty stuff, obvious, like what you should do, but, but it's not always obvious no, for No, because people. a lot of times obligers will say, well, I need to learn to put myself first. I need to learn learn yeah. to uh, have more motivation. I'm like, forget yeah. about motivation. It doesn't yeah. matter. Like all you yeah. need is outer accountability. Oh, I like the way you do so But well. rebels, they do badly with outer accountability. They don't like somebody looking over their shoulder or telling them what to do or telling them when to show up. So with a rebel, it's all about spontaneity and doing what you feel like whenever you feel like it. So like opposite, you know, sometimes you can try to be helping, like you say with the love languages, but if you're speaking the wrong language, you can actually be counterproductive for someone because you're doing, you're setting it up in a way that's not right for their tendency. So, right. and as a questioner, maybe you've suffered from analysis paralysis. This is when questioners want more and more and more information, and then they find it hard to make a decision or move forward because they're like, but I don't know, maybe there's a better way to exercise, or maybe there's a more efficient way to do this, or I don't know, like maybe I really would be better off with cardio rather than strength training. And like, they, they just keep, they just want more and more and more. And sometimes you have to make, you can't it's always you have perfect it's, information. Yeah, it's true, it's yeah. true. So when you know kind of what the pitfalls are of your particular tendency, you can figure out, okay, well, how do I address that? Right, which is where you come in. Yes. Right. Yeah. You are filled with practical knowledge about this kind of stuff. Well, because this solution is a very based. practical. You're very solution based. Yeah, this is a very practical. This isn't just like, like abstractly who you are. This is like, you want to quit sugar. Let's figure out how you can quit sugar. Right. Which, by the way, I just want to say before we um, have to end this at some point is that with the Happiness Project, I know that you've received some criticism about writing a book about happiness when mm -hmm. people perceive that you haven't faced adversity, mm -hmm. and it totally misses the point for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, did they read the book? I know, probably not. <laughs> probably yeah. not. Yeah. When they give you any of that criticism, and you do something really sweet in the Happiness Project that was very touching to me and very tender, which was as a young writer when I read it, you talk about dealing with criticism uh -huh. as a writer, yeah. and you you wrote an email to the person who criticized yeah. you, which I thought was really big of you and yeah. really beautiful. Yeah. Um, and and it was like, oh wow, she's faced rejection, she's mm -hmm. faced failure. It's so important for us to see the people yes. we think are so successful and are successful, they're, they're failure stories, right? Sure, we need sure. to hear those because they keep oh, us going. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Um, I thought it totally missed the point because, P.S., Gretchen, I was really happy you were in a hot mess writing mm. Happiness Project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but people right, would say to me, like, where's the narrative so arc? And I'm cool. like, well, I can't get addicted to heroin and for, like, to give you a good narrative <laughs> Come arc. Come on. Like, yeah. You know, I yeah, it just, um, I don't know. It was really, it, there's a comfort in it. And um, if you listen to the book on Audible as well, you can hear your voice. I mean, everyone loves your voice now, right? Your voice Aww. has sort of become this like iconic thing. Oh, that's and nice. it's true. And uh, I don't know. It was just really, it, there was a, I don't want to say sweet because that makes it sound dumbed down. And it's not. It's very intelligent. And again, because you're able to pull from history and philosophy and science in this book. It's jam-packed with stuff. But it just missed the point for me completely. And, and that voice that you are trying to um, share with your reader, that experience was that I'm doing this at a time in my life when I know I'm not facing major mm -hmm. adversity. Right. Because, and that was very um, tender for me as well to hear because I've dealt with people facing massive adversity yeah. for so long. Yeah. Right? That yeah. you were doing this as saying, like, how can we prepare ourselves yes. for the. Yes. That one phone call in the middle yes. of the night we're going to get. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because after I wrote that, I heard from many people who were facing major adversity, yes. and they said, like, this is a really good idea. Like, you, that's the time to, like, try to get everything in your life better because we're all going to get that phone call in the middle of the night. And, you know, and it's like that's not the time when you can address these kind of deep uh, patterns of your life. You have to do that when you have the emotional and physical wherewithal to address them. So it's like... It's when things aren't falling apart often that you can you can kind of think about happiness in a way because at some other times you're just so busy dealing with whatever's happening. Without you having to get too personal with us unless mm. you want to, have you faced that 
tragedy yet or, or some level of adversity well, where you were like, I had a, this was put to the test? I had a near miss, and this is a medical miracle. So when my uh. husband was eight years old, he had, he had a genetic uh, mal malformation of his heart. So he had to have a heart surgery. And this was before hepatitis C was identified in the blood supply. So he got hepatitis C oh, starting yes. when, he's, when he was eight years old. Uh, now, the thing about hepatitis C I is it's- I think you make reference to yeah. this in the book, like how did your liver test go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So it has a big runway. It's got 30 years, right? But then by the time we got married, um, he'd had it for a long time. Yes. And uh, the thing about hepatitis C is it attacks the liver. And believe me, your liver is your friend. You really want to hang on to your liver. Yeah. And so for a long time, it was really this thing where, you know, and his doctor kept saying like, just hang on to your liver. If you can just hang on to your liver, science is coming. There's going to be a cure for this. And I'm like, what are you going to do? Like, what is he going to, you can't mind, you know, yeah. like talk to your liver. Um, but he held on and then there was a new treatment that was approved by the FDA. He went on it like that day. For hep C. For hep I've C. I've had some patients go on it who were And he, and, and he'd he done would. all sorts of experimental ones that made him sick as a dog yes. and it didn't work. And it worked. And it worked. And I, I remember at so the time. So does he test negative for hep C now? Yes. Isn't it amazing? Yes. January 9th is our it's anniversary. It's giving people, it's giving no, people 100%. like a it's new It's just out. Yes. It's out. It's yeah. out. It's amazing. And the thing about the liver is um, it's a very, it, like, it will just do its job. Like, he's got a lot of scarring, but it doesn't matter. The liver just sort of Hanging soldiers there. on. Yeah, <laughs> soldiers on. So I feel like we, for a long time, we were sort of every so odd, you know, he'd go in and have it tested, and it was always like, well, he's at stage three. So there was you a really don't want to be yeah. tension to this book that we don't fully well, you know, get in the Happiness though, Project as a psychoanalyst. Well, but the funny thing is, is that we didn't think about it that much. I think other people would have been much more anxious and yeah. thinking about it all the time. And both of us, were, like, I think one thing that was nice was that we were like, we were focused on it. We were like, very, like he took, did experimental yes. treatments, yes. and he was very aggressive about doing what he could. But we didn't overly worry about it. Like we didn't have like I didn't wait, stay awake late at night, night after night after night, thinking about it or anything. But I did was you feel able that to sensation just, when he was finally cured that oh, it must huge. have been there in the background a lot more than you even think yes, it is? That is true. Yes, that yeah, is true. And I would I find myself like, having thoughts and then being like, oh, I don't have to have this thought. Yeah, you know? yeah. No, know. it was. I think it it's was. there more than we think it is. Yes, and, I know. and it is. So I feel super fortunate that he he was at stage three, and they were like, if you could just hang out at stage three until the solution comes. And boy, it went, yeah, that was a great day. Oh, that was good, a great day. Good. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so right before I ask you the last question, which is about your new book, because oh, okay. I, one of the questions is what's in the future for Gretchen? Great. And I'm sorry, because we didn't even get to any of the game, but I can't keep oh, you like okay. here all day, obviously. Okay. <laughs> um, um, I, I, this is, this is, I, I don't want this to sound anything but positive. But I think a lot about uh, this quote that Elizabeth Lesser, do you know who Elizabeth Lesser is? Uh, yeah. She started the Omega Institute. Oh, right, yeah, she sure, wrote a great sure, yeah. book called Broken Open. Yeah. She wrote another one called Marrow About. Uh, she was the donor for her sister's uh, mm. bone marrow. Oh, I just read that book. She's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, I just She's read that really book. Beautiful. Yes, yes, the one that just came out like two yes. years ago. Yes, she won I read the board. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, she had a very writing. complicated uh, relationship yes. with her sister. She's yes, a beautiful writer. Yes, it's a very good book. It's yeah. Broken Open. Have you read Broken yes. Open? I read the one about the about the transplant. Oh, okay. So her, her book, like, she only writes. I shouldn't say only. She really, she pulls these books together. I guess she gives us the gift of one. Mm -hmm. Once every like five to ten years. Yes. And so Broken Open, if you have a chance, okay. it's changed my life completely. Oh my gosh, therapist. I'm going to write it down. <laughs> it's yeah. one of my favorite books okay, ever. Great. Um, well, I really enjoyed her other ones. And it's, so. it's about sort of people facing the Phoenix process. When everything mm -hmm. burns to the ashes, how do you mm -hmm. find your way out of the ashes? Mm -hmm. And she obviously has a lot of experience because she's run the Omega Institute, so she's interviewed everyone you can imagine, mm -hmm. Dalai Lama mm -hmm. to Oprah, I think, to, to everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, she's sort of steeped in spirituality. And I really admire her as a writer. So I almost threw up before the interview. Ah. It was one of my first ones High that I was praise. doing. And I, I said, I just told her I had to be a real, yeah. right? Be Gretchen. Yeah, be yeah, now. Yeah, 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 be First now. commandment yeah. in the Happiness Project as yeah. a female. I'm just going to tell her, like, yeah. what's up? Like, I might get sick during this yeah. interview. I'm more nervous to talk to her than I am to get on Fox in front of 9 million people yeah, yeah, yeah. and talk about politics. Isn't that funny? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, at the very end of the interview, I asked her a question about happiness, and she looked at me and she said, well, no, I don't want to be happy. I want to be moved. Mm, yeah, well, you can play that game. And I was like, tell me how you feel about that. It, like, it was like a punch in the gut. And obviously doing what I do, people really want to come in and, and find more happiness. Mm -hmm. And I have to be honest with you, though, because I struggle with this question on a personal level because I love to be moved. But mm -hmm. I've had years in my life where I wasn't as happy as I should have been. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. kind of by my own doing sort of mm -hmm. because we get in a rut or yeah. I always tell patients you're more addicted sometimes to the negative than yes. the positive because yeah. it just becomes the habit that yeah. you're used to for sure to sort of existing in that yeah. framework and I feel a lot of mourning and loss about the world around us sometimes mm -hmm. it really gets me yeah. down so I just wondered what you thought of, of mm. that quote that she said to me. Well, I think this, so I started out, as you said, my career in law. So yes. I have many memories of spending an entire semester arguing about the definition of a contract. Yes. And you can, and happiness is even, or has, I know, I don't want even to more like, complicated. Yeah. I think there's something like 15 academic definitions of happiness. And so people get into this thing where it's like, it's not about happiness. It's about peace. It's about fulfillment. Yeah, it's about I'm sure you get this annoying yeah, thing, And right? I'm just like, I'm like, whatever it is that you want, it's like, given what you want, whatever yeah. you would call it, yeah. how can you get as much of that as you can within, given the, your, your circumstances and your nature? Mm -hmm. So if you want to be happy, if you got more sleep, would you be happier? If you joined a book group, would you be happier? If you quit sugar, would you be happier? If you want to be moved, it's like, okay, if you want to be moved, what are the things that you could do? giving your circumstances and your nature that would allow you to have more of that. I don't think that, I think that people, I just have had a lot of people who are like, let's yes. play, let's play the synonym game. Yeah. And I, or, or people who will say things to me like, and I, I, don't I don't care about that synonym game no, 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 as no, no, much no, as I just no, no, want no, you to what, help yeah, me work yeah, sure, it out sure, in my sure. own no, head. No, and it took me a long time to think yes, about it, but then yeah. until I realized like I was just going to evade the question altogether. <laughs> because people will say to me something like, well, I don't want to be happy. What I want oh, is to live yeah. a life no, of that's, purpose that's and deep engagement with other people. And I'm like, well, well what do you think you would do to be happy? That is right. what a person would do to be happy. Right. To have and I don't like the, if, the yes or no questions. Well, and right? I think, because I think, everything's in, about being dynamic and a complicated thing. Yeah, yeah, and I think people, I think that, I think happiness, the, I, the word happiness has a kind of bad reputation, funnily enough, and people think it's kind of superficial or it's kind of glib or easy. And they think, yeah. well, if people who are happy, like they're not. They don't think about the problems of the world. It's, maybe people think it's not morally no. appropriate to be happy when there's so much suffering in the world, or they think that people are very complacent. But what research shows is that the people who are happy, um, happier people are more interested in the problems of the world and problems of other people. They give away more money. They yeah, volunteer they, more they time. Make more money. You yeah. know, they've got the emotional wherewithal yes. to turn outward and to help other people. And when we're less happy or whatever, oh, you would say. you can't get off the couch. Yeah, because you become defensive and isolated and preoccupied with your own problems because yes. you're not happy. And so... But to say, but so when people are like, I don't want to be this, I want to be that, I'm like, yeah, whatever. I just, you know, what, you know I just don't I, find I, it interesting. Well, and so, I, and for me, it was like, okay, well, people come into my office depressed or they're anxious or they're looking yeah. for more happiness or they're trying to figure something out for yeah. themselves. So I've talked for hours about happiness, right? Yeah. Thousands of hours about the idea of happiness. And so your book has been influential to me because in the on the bottom line, as much as I do, I love to be moved. Yeah, I love to. We Francis love Weller, yeah, yeah. another one of my favorite writers and one of my spiritual teachers, wrote a beautiful book on grief called *The Wild Edge of Sorrow*. And it's one of the most gorgeous books. Another one uh, to title. add to your list. Yeah, he's an amazing writer. Uh, and I did a grief workshop with him um, out in California last year. And so I think deeply about these questions of happiness and the other side of happiness, which was grief and being moved and stuff like that. In the end, I come down to this, which is something in your book, which is, it's harder to be light yeah. than it is to be Heavy. sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just is. Mm -hmm. Like this, it, and I, as I, as I evolve in my practice, as I evolve as a human being, as I evolve in everything that I do, I'm starting to believe more and more into these ideas of devotion, mm -hmm. devoting myself to somebody else mm -hmm. or devoting myself to my work. This, mm -hmm. I love this concept. I haven't quite worked it out yet mm -hmm. of devotion. Yes, it's but a it's, beautiful it's word. a beautiful word, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Just the idea of like mm -hmm. devoting yourself. Mm -hmm. Danny Shapiro wrote a, a memoir about devotion. About devotion. Mm -hmm. And the second one is that it's just, you know, I spent a lot of time sort of absorbing what I did for my patients and they gave my life an enormous amount of meaning. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. At some point, I was burnt out, and yes. I said I have to step away for yes. a while because I'm yes. taking it all in all yeah. the time. And we all know that every conversation you have changes yes. your brain. Yes. And if you're kind of in that work for a long yeah. time, I needed to pass the baton to people who yes. were fresher than I was right, at right. a certain point. For sure. I also knew it was time to teach. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, in my own life, the hard, the hard place, the the wound, has been to learn how to be light, mm. especially when I think. Deep down, you're a real intellectual, and so you're always going for like the books, the mm -hmm. heaviness. Like yeah. I have friends who could go a year without reading a book, and they they seem yeah. happier than I do in a lot of ways, uh -huh. right? 
But I constantly need that intellectual engagement. Yeah. I love it. It's heavy. Yeah. Right? It's, there's an intensity. There's an intensity. There's an intensity too. about you. Yeah. You listen to your podcast. Yeah, yeah. You, no, I'm a relentless person. I mean, yes. and like, and it, that's, yes, yes. It's yes. True. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and I think that that is why your book is also really beautiful because it's, when you're that way, it, sometimes it's quite hard to be like. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. I often think yeah. with my parenting, I wondered if you felt this way, I'd rather be reading. Uh -huh. I think I need a t-shirt that says all the time, like, I yeah. just got to be reading. Yeah, yeah. And I feel so guilty. I love yeah. you guys. You're probably watching this. I yeah. love you yeah. so yeah. much. Yeah. But yeah. when yeah. you're used to doing no. that kind of work. No, I remember when a friend of mine, it was a tremendous relief. He goes, well, you know, I hate the playground. <laughs> and he's like, what? How, can you hate the You're playground? He goes, no. And he's playground? like, it's so boring. I oh. hate going to the playground. I was like, <gasps> oh no. I didn't know you could do that. See, I drive friends like you to the playground. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, and yeah, talk yeah, books yeah, and yeah, nerd yeah, it yeah, out yeah, while the kids yeah, like yeah, yeah, fend yeah, for themselves. Yeah, yeah. I know. Um, no, I think, but I think if you're right, back to this idea of being LB Gretchen, it's yes. like when you know that you tend to go to the, like get weighed down by the heavy, it's like, well, how can you find that lightness in yourself? Like, yes. like one thing that I do is like we celebrate holiday breakfast. So if there's a minor holiday, we'll do, I'll do like a funny thing for breakfast, like dye the milk pink or I'll dye the peanut butter black or I whatever know. it is. I I want to be your kid. Yeah, no, and it's just, it's just like a little, but it's like I have to deliberately do that and plan it and schedule it because that's know. my nature. But right. then it is a little moment of levity or like a little yes. light moment yes. because I think you're right. When you know that about yourself, Yourself, then you can kind of think about well, how could I deliberately build in some joy, kind of counterbalance, right? Some joy, and I think for some people, probably what they need is more gravity. Yes. You know, like they're just they feel like they maybe aren't connected enough to transcendent ideas, or they, yes. they aren't don't have a sense of purpose or meaning, and so they need to find that. So I think for all of us, it's like well, given your nature and your values and your interests, what can you do to have yes. the life that you want? I think you're right. A lot of times there's slow hanging fruit. There's stuff that like, it wouldn't be that hard to fix this. I know. If we take the time to have the realization. It's true. I think in the driver behind all of your books really is curiosity. You're an enormously mm. curious person. I, I am. And curiosity is the fifth drive, mm -hmm. right? The thing of curiosity is the fifth drive. Ah. And so without curiosity, yes. we don't thrive as human beings. And yes. that is a real driver for me when I read your books. I'm like, this woman's enormously curious, and we share that in common. Yeah. Just to say, I just wanted to say I share something in common. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, okay, so before we end, the new book. What's so it about? It's a, it's a fun, light book. I decided yeah. I wanted to write a light book, and it's a called Outer Order, Inner Calm, because something that I've written about a lot is the weird degree to which for most people, not everyone, but most people, outer order contributes to inner calm yes. and a sense of kind of possibility and energy and creativity and calm and like more than it should because it's are like in a, in, a, in, a, in a happy life, like a crowded coat closet or an overflowing in basket is not a big deal. So why is it that people, like a, 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 this guy I know said, I finally cleaned out my fridge and now I know I can switch careers. And I was like, I know exactly how that feels. <laughs> oh, you right. know? You're and just you, like, whoa. Oh, like I, oh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I feel so that way after I pay my taxes. <laughs> no, exactly. It's that same I thing like the yeah. big crossing and like Ugh. all the papers that can get yes. shredded and it all gets mailed off. Yeah. So it is that feeling. And so I thought I want to write a book that looks at that. Like what is that connection about? And then also like it's kind of a pump up book about like if you want to clear clutter, it's like full of kind of funny ideas and strategies uh, to get you kind of psyched up to tackle your clutter because it is weirdly thrilling. Did you have the same energy and enthusiasm to write that book as you have the others? Yeah, yes. It's funny. It was a hooky book. It was a book that I was working on on the side of when I was finishing up The Four Tendencies. So I would do it as kind of like when I oh, was in the mood of uh, doing it. I in had the a music teacher and we I had to play hooky music. Like I had to only study classical piano with her. Yeah. And then at home I could do like Star Wars yeah, 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 or yeah, 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 anything yeah. fun. Yeah. yeah it's she fun. called it hooky music. Yeah. That's well, there you phrase. go. Yeah. So phrase. this was my, like if I was playing hooky. And then I did another hooky book, which is all about color. It's called my color pilgrimage. Uh, so, um, my sister makes fun of me because she's like, like coloring books. You no, 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 like the color. Well, I like do have a color, coloring book, yeah. but like color, like there's all these just like colors actually very, very strange and weird and mysterious. And yes, it's fascinating. It and there's like deadly color and invisible color. And, and anyway. energy with color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, um, so, uh, so this book was, um, it started, started kind of as a lark. And, um, and then it just kind of grew and grew and grew. And finally I was like, wow, this is a real book. And so it's, it's a real book, but it's, it's, it's a much kind of lighter book. If you've read the book, um, Food Rules by Michael Pollan, that was kind of my inspiration. It, it ended up not being very much like that book in the end after I kind of put my own stamp Spin on it. it. Yeah. But that was the book that inspired me because I was just so enchanted by I the way that I think you mentioned book. one of those books. Maybe. Not, I think. I talked about Gary Tobbs, Why We Get oh, Fat. Oh, yes, yes, Why We Get Fat. 
Okay. Um, that changed my life. Yeah. That was like a total <laughs> life change book. Uh, March 2012 is when yes. I read that book. Yeah. Um, but but Michael Pollan, it was more like the format, like these little paragraphs and kind of funny ideas to kind of get you excited to eat right. So I was like, I want to write a book about that. that like is clutter. getting people like yeah, up for organized it. Yes. and decluttered and add, adding so beauty. Good. Yeah, yeah, it feels so good. So March, it comes out in March. Comes out in March. I'm so excited. And the 10th anniversary of the Happiness Project comes out in November, so that's exciting too. Just in a couple yeah. weeks. Yes, I know. So it's got a whole new like stuff and you have, in the back. And and because she's not busy enough, she has the podcast. Yes, yes, the Happier and, Podcast. And you launched an online course about the four tendencies. Yes, 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 because so many people are like either they want to learn more about it themselves or they want to teach a workshop on it. Yes. So now I have both of those. Oh, for people. right, because they can teach it in their in their work environment. Yeah, because a lot of people are sort of like, I want to take my whole team through this, yes. or like all the you know. Yes, it's really modestly priced. Oh, good. Well, thank you. <laughs> I was like, Gretchen, you're doing everybody a favor because oh, this is like good stuff. Oh, good. Well, thank you. I was like, so just saying, just plugging it right there. Oh, there you go. Like, thank yeah, you. Yeah, you made good. it. You made it affordable for yeah, people, yeah, yeah. which is really nice because sometimes yeah. the online classes get. Even though I'm, I'm doing this from HQ Teachable, yeah. sometimes they can get really expensive. Yeah, they can. Yeah, they can. so thank yeah. you, Gretchen. You're oh. a real gift. Oh, well, thank you. You're I so feel like we generous. could talk all day. Uh, we We're could. interested in all the same things. I know, I know. Again, I'm going to say I feel like I met a kindred soul just because I want to say that about Gretchen. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.